So let's go ahead and do an example that has both tangent normal components as well as Cartesian components. Okay, and so uh, this is going to be a, a girl who's on a swing, and we'll say that the swing has, has two chains. Um, let's see, do I want to do it in that angle? I'll just draw a separate little picture here for the, because I have it swinging the other way. I can flip her around, but. So let's say that this is the center of mass of the person. Um, so they look something like, you know, here's their head and their arms are holding on and their body and they're sitting here on this swing. Uh, let's say that the swing is about 10 feet long. So from here up to here will be 10 feet. We'll start at an angle of 60 degrees here from horizontal. And then the final position that we're going to compute is basically when point C, I'll say C prime, swings down there to vertical. Okay, so we're just going to swing an arc of 30 degrees um, between, um, if you think of your, either 30, 30 degrees off of vertical or 60 degrees off of horizontal down to vertical. So we'll say that a 60 pound person swings from 60 degrees below horizontal to, to vertical. Um, if they start at rest, what is their final speed final speed and the tension in each rope? Oh, I think that fixed it. It was getting really annoying, obviously, you saw I was skipping and things, and I think my, my tip, which had left-handed threads, as I just discovered, which is interesting, um, was loose. I was making a bad contact. Um, all right, so we're just going to swing here. So now if you got to choose how to solve this problem with either um, Newtonian, the approach that we're going to take Cartesian, or work energy, which I know all of you probably remember work energy, even before I get into the math, which do you think would be easier? Work energy, right? We'd still have to come back to Newtonian kinetics to find out the tension, right? Because the work energy would not tell us the tension in those ropes, but it would easily tell us that final speed, okay? But we're going to work through this with Newtonian. Also to show you, I mentioned earlier that working in Newtonian is not always the easiest way to solve a problem, and this is one of those problems, um, and you'll see how that kind of develops. All right, but we will solve this um, with Newtonian. Let's go ahead. Because we're going to use Newtonian kinetics, we do need a free body diagram. So we'll just call this here point C, in, in indicating the centroid um, of the person. And we'll start at our initial coordinate system here. Um, N goes up basically right up this direction towards the center of curvature. And then T will be in the direction of motion coming down this direction that will be T. And so our angle, if this is, let's see here, 60 degrees below horizontal, we find out, of course, that this is going to be 60 degrees. And then the other thing that we have, or I shouldn't say that, uh, a couple other things that we have going on here, right, is we have these tension forces getting into the forces here on this free body diagram. Call this 2 times T, 2 times the tension in each one of those cables. Uh, and then the other one we have is this uh, mass times gravity, right? The weight of that person pulling them down. Um, and so those would be the only forces overall. Uh, and we can work through the coordinate system to also know that um, this is also 60 degrees uh, below tangent, right? Because fundamentally, this little shared angle in here sums up with both of those 60s to equal 90. And so uh, this is one of those cases where we have a, a, a line measured 60 degrees, in this case from horizontal, 
And then we can find that a vertical um, to the tangent, which is perpendicular to that um, horizontal line, well, from the vertical to the tangent then becomes 60 as well. Okay, so that's our free body diagram um, of all our forces. So then we can get into our Newtonian equation, which tells us that... So now we will say we have a sum of forces in the T equals our mass times acceleration in that tangent direction. So if I take a look at the forces I have in the T direction, 100% of 2T is in the normal direction, so none of that's going to be in the tangent. I only have a component there of my weight. And, so, and that's going to be in a positive T. It's going to be the cosine term. And so the sum of forces equals a total of 60 times the cosine of theta. Now you'll notice as I'm writing this out that I'm going to leave this for right now in terms of a variable theta because the relationship between the weight and the tangent axes will change as the swinger goes from, uh, I should say instead of swinger, that's bad connotations there, as the person goes from, um, from, 60, or from 60 degrees below horizontal to vertical. Okay, so I'm going to leave that as a variable because what I'm going to need to end up doing is actually take an integral of this function to figure out how much of that weight is in that tangent direction as it, as it swings through that arc. Okay? And so currently leaving that as theta. Our mass, of course, is just going to be the weight of 60 divided by 32.2. I can glance at the problem and say, all right, 60 pounds, need to divide by English unit um, gravitational constant. And then this will be times r a sub t, which we don't know what that is yet. Okay, so we have two unknowns here. Um, I also then could rewrite this, right, if I know that I want to um, eventually likely do something with this tangential acceleration, I can write this as a sub t is equal to... 32.2, basically divide both sides by 60, bring the 32.2 over times the cosine of theta. Once again, a mass independent tangential acceleration, right? Uh, um, we ended up dividing out that 60 pounds, and it's really only a, a function of the, um, the gravitational coefficient. So let me just put this little note here that say this varies with position, therefore leave as theta for now. All right, so let's go ahead and do the same thing in the normal direction. So in the normal direction, we have sum of forces normal equals mass times acceleration normal. Now I have both my 2t, which is going in a positive normal direction, as well as a component there of that weight. And so now I have 2t positive, and then my component of the weight's going in a normal direction. Uh, it's going to be the sine term, so minus 60 sine of theta, once again leaving it as um, an uh, variable value, and then that equals the same mass, 60 divided by 32.2. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can um, express this normal acceleration, right? Like, I can leave it at a, as a sub n. In this case, I know that I want to work toward a speed, right? That was one of the things that it asked for, say, hey, what's the speed at the bottom? And so I'm going to express this as v squared over my radius, which was 10 foot, because we had a, or sorry, not 10 foot. Uh, yes, it was 10 foot. Uh, in my head, I forgot if it was feet or meters, but um, let me make sure I wrote that right. Yep, 10 feet, 60 pounds, everything's in English units. And so now this becomes a relationship between velocity and theta. Now, one of the things that we can do right here in this equation, so this is like our alternative to doing work energy, is I could go ahead at this point and plug in a theta of 90 degrees, right? Uh, so when they swing down to, um, to vertical, and then solve for v, and that will give me my velocity at the bottom of that arc, right? And so this, like I said, this would be my alternative to doing work energy and taking a look at the change between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Um, this equation basically holds that same relationship. 
Um, and so we can end up from here saying that V at 90 degrees is equal to uh, 9.29 feet per second. Okay, so that would be the answer to the final speed um, is 9.29 feet per second. Now, if you wanted to transform that into um, a vector, right, that's one of the great things about tangent normal coordinate systems, anytime that you have a velocity that um, has a certain magnitude, what direction is it going in relative to tangent normal? Just tangent, right? It's defined that particle motion um, is in the tangent direction, right? So all of your velocities, is one of the nice things about tangent normals, you'll never have like components like you do in R theta. You have one velocity component um, if you have something moving along a path and that is in the tangent direction because the tangent direction is moving with it. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. I jumped too fast. I have three variables there. Yeah, I do. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> I just had this note next to it that I was like, oh, I can just solve for that now, but then, of course, I can't. All right, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to the 9.29 after we solve for t, but I'll leave it there for now, just for posterity. Good question. Bad not, not a bad answer, just... Um, all right, so... Um, all right, so I have here this acceleration um, and position. And so this is where this problem gets a little bit interesting. But once again, one of the reasons why um, it's not always a lot of fun to work accelerations is that we now have an acceleration as a function of angular position. Now, this angular position is also a function of the arc like the path length, the arc length, as that person swings from 60 degrees below horizontal to vertical. So the equation that we're going to use to basically translate between acceleration and figure out what the velocity is as a function of theta is our friend V d V is equal to A d S. Right? We haven't talked about time in this problem at all. We've talked about position, velocity, and acceleration. And so as we take a look at this equation, you might be asking yourself, and this is probably the order I should have explained it in, how do we end up with an acceleration ds when I currently have an acceleration functionally as, as a function of theta? And what we can do with that is we can say that ds, the change in the arc length along the path as they're swinging, is equal to the radius 10 times d theta, right? That's the position arc length function. So really what it's saying here, I'll just draw it out real fast. Well, I don't need that big of a path. I'll just do a little curve path. So curve path here, center point up here. If I have a, an angle from here down to here of d theta, then this distance out here on the arc ds is just going to be the radius 10 times that arc, right? That's the arc length equation. It just tells us, right, that what is the arc length given a radius um, and a certain of angular change. So we now can substitute into this equation 10 d theta anywhere that we saw ds, and now we can integrate over theta instead of s, and everything will work out. All right, so let's set this up. So now we have a um, V D V, the velocities that we're trying to solve for, is equal to our acceleration, which is 32.2 cosine of theta times 10 D theta, right? Because this is what I substituted in for DS. And so this acceleration... Now, keep in mind also, I could always put a little sub t in that equation because if we're talking about the time or um, distance rate of change of the acceleration, we're always talking about the tangential change, not the normal. Okay, so the normal is going to come from somewhere else. It's always going to be the tangent that comes from either taking a time derivative of the position, an integral of the acceleration, um, or I shouldn't say, well, the, either the 
the time derivative of the velocity or the second time derivative of the position, I guess would be the better way to say that. Okay, now we'll go ahead and integrate this over both sides. Um, if the, the person did not start with the zero velocity, you'd have to put in whatever the initial velocity was there in the bottom of this integral. Uh, in this case, we started with at rest, so that's zero, and then the top's going to be the final. And then the angle here that we're going to work through, um, this is just kind of a warning as, as angles and calculators, especially if you're computing integrals in your calculator, to always push them into radians. Okay, there's, there's a lot of errors that you end up getting, particularly on taking integrals of sine and cosine functions. If you try to use degrees, even if you're like, oh, my calculator's set in degrees, it'll all work out fine. It'll give you a number at the end that it will then kind of expect you to convert from, from um, how do I say that? There's like a, a built-in lack of conversion to get it back into the units you think you might get. So if you're in radians, things work out fine, 100% of the time. Um, if you're not, if you're in degrees, um, let me see if I have those. I thought I had that little exercise. I'll pull that. I, I, I need to find, did I talk about that in statics? I don't think I did. I think it's something in dynamics here, and I, I don't have that sheet right in front of me. But um, I'll show you the little exercise we'll walk through on the calculator, and we'll do it by hand, we'll do it with the calculator, and you'll expect your calculator is going to get the right answer, and it'll look like it's the wrong answer, but it's, the reality is it's a conversion factor. And so we're going to basically convert these angles into uh, radians, and so 60 is equal to um, pi over 3, and then 90 degrees is equal to pi over 2. Okay, so we're going to go from pi over 3 to pi over 2 will be the limits on this integral. So from pi over 3 to pi over 2. Now I can just multiply this 10 times 32.2, right? Those are just two coefficients, and so we can end up with a 322. Um, on the left-hand side here, we get a v squared over two because we had no initial um, velocity and so this becomes 322 times an integral from pi over 3 to pi over 2 of cosine of theta d theta and so just working through this math um, we find that right the integral of cosine is just going to give us a sine um, and so this would be v squared over 2 times 322 integration pi over 3 to pi over 2. Ah, I didn't want to write that way. I want to take this integral and evaluate it. So the integral sine of theta. And we're going to evaluate that between pi over 2, sorry, pi over 3 to pi over 2. And so we would multiply this whole thing by 2. We take a square root after we work through that integral. And then we find that our velocity shows now um, 9.29 feet per second. So this is actually, my apologize, my apologize, we'll go back up, but this is actually the source now of my velocity. I will now use this to go back up and solve for my tangent, or not my tangent, but my tension force T. And so here's my velocity, and then I bring that back up to here, so basically putting in this into this velocity, we then solve for T, and that T ends up being 38.0 pounds in each cable at the bottom um, of the arc of swing. So a couple of conceptual questions. Does that 38 make sense? Right? We had a 60 pound person swinging. There are two ropes, right? So if this was statics, we'd expect 30. Does it make sense that there's more tension in those cables because they're swinging across the bottom? And why? Brian's nodding yes. He thought he was just bouncing back there. Yeah, I was nodding. 
Why is that? Well, because you're going in the downward direction and you're now going up, and so you need to actually force to counteract that velocity. That's great, right? We need fundamentally a positive normal force to keep us in that arc, right? Normal direction going toward the center of curvature, and so we need this additional force that's pushing up um, to keep, them, keep the person in that arc so they continue swinging along that pathway, right? So we need some additional force um, greater than the 30 pounds, and so we end up with 38 pounds. Where would the tension values in the rope be the greatest, and where would they be the least? Um, assuming that there's, say, swinging an arc from like horizontal to horizontal, right? So not all the way around the whole top, but just say horizontal to horizontal. Where would the tension be the greatest? Right here, the bottom. Where's it going to be the least? On the top, it would be right if they went all the way around. But otherwise, it would be you know, basically um, on those horizontal points. And we've all kind of felt that in swings, right? It's like there's certain points where your stomach just kind of goes, whoa. Um, and a lot of that happens usually is like our bodies get a little disconcerted when we're used to having kind of gravity hold us down to things. And you get swinging up to a certain height on a swing. Um, all of a sudden, like your seat, your rear end will start lifting off the seat, right? And you just kind of feels like you're about to launch into space. But luckily, is you know you're you're moving with that swing, and so you come back down and, and land back on the seat. So it's always worth asking yourself these questions. Like when you get numerical answers, do they make sense, right? And what other kinds of questions could we ask with the same scenario? Um, essentially, you're testing just what do I understand about this um, these coordinate systems and how forces and the axis systems work. All right, so that was kind of a pain, right, to have to work through this integral and end up doing a, an, an S, a DS versus D theta substitution, so then it can end up using that function, which is a function of theta. So like I said, the, the flip side of this was that you could have taken this tangent piece, this whole integral piece down here, and substituted in a very quick and easy work energy calculation, found that velocity, and then could have jumped back in here right just into this section and that section alone, because that's the only direction that that normal's in. You still would have had to write that function there, plug in your velocity, and you could have solved for tension using that. Okay, so it's kind of showing some of the efficiencies, and it's one of the reasons that we, we love work energy, is we can worry about, instead of worrying about what happens all the way in between in motion, we just have a beginning and an ending, and that's it. Okay, and so we'll get into work energy actually um, next week um, after the exam. Questions on this example? Now, probably the hardest step in this one is, you know, after you had this equation in thinking about where do I get velocity from that equation, right? So to think that um, given this equation here, thinking about what is theta, theta is functionally, it's an angular position, right? So you have this equation that's really acceleration as a function of position, and you want velocity. And so, you know, we've talked before that if you have acceleration, velocity, and position, this is the equation should come to mind. It's also, um, you know, given you don't know anything else to do in a problem, it's worth looking at, right, if you haven't explored that direction yet. Um, we only have so many ways that we can relate um, acceleration, velocity, and position, particularly if we don't involve time. Um, and that's, that's one of the primary ones. All right, questions on this example? Let's scroll back down to make sure everybody got the. Yeah. 